Uh, I am Sarah Speed, Chair of the Financial Services Group at the British Chamber of Commerce and uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon to consider the topic of ESG. ESG is a subject which has had increased focus in recent years in the financial services industry but with the uh, event of COVID-19 I think there has been renewed emphasis uh, particularly as we now consider how we bring back our economies whilst addressing concerns about the environment, our society and corporate governance processes. I'm delighted to uh, uh, host our distinguished panel of guests this afternoon. Uh, the discussion will be moderated by Nazir Zubairi, the CEO of uh, Luxembourg House of Financial Technology. And the panellists will be uh, Natalie Westerbarkey, who is Head of uh, EU Public Policy at Fidelity International. Good afternoon, everyone. We have uh, Sachin Vankelas, who is the CEO of Luxflag. And uh, Ian Chu, who is the founder and MD of Ecofolio. Uh, and, looking which, and he looks particularly at um, asset-based inv asset investing, particularly forests. Uh, so, Nazir, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you so you can start the discussion. Thank you. And, and thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to the British Chamber of Commerce for hosting this discussion and to our distinguished panellists for being online and with us today. Um, so we're here to talk about ESG investing and the renewed focus or the general focus and growth in this sector. But let's set some foundation, I think. I mean, the terminology here, guys, um, ESG investing, sustainable finance, social impact investing, green investing. Uh, what do all these things mean? How do they overlap? Maybe we could start with uh, Natalie. Um, as an investor yourself, how do you view all these different um, subjects and how do you distinguish between them? What do they all mean? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's a great honor to be participating today. And uh, from an asset manager point of view, um, the term is, is really um, to be looked at like an evolution. So I think some uh, many years ago, it started with something like impact investing. Then it came about to more like um, socially responsible investing. And um, then it sort of added a bit more level of sophistication. Um, some also then started to look at it more from a point of view of, of excluding certain corporates or sectors. Um, I think nowadays we've reached a much more comprehensive and holistic um, definition of sustainable finance, which include E, so environmental, S, social and G, governance factors. Um, but you can very uh, easily map these ESG factors also to, to the sustainable development goals uh, at the United Nations level. So I think we are really now entering more into a phase of so-called responsible capitalism, where we look at any corporate that we invest in, how is it overall positioned with regards to the ESG factors, um, and what's the direction of travel? And with that, I hand back over to you, Nasir. Okay, and uh, thank you for your, for your views there. Um, Sachin, as a labeling agency here, I mean, you, you look into this in great detail. How, how are you distinguishing? Even the other day, we were talking also about the gender lens in, in all of this as well. So there's lots of multiple factors. Give, give me some criteria to add to Natalie's uh, distinguished um, opinion on these different areas. Good. Thank you, Nazir, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Well, um, as Natalie mentioned, of course, there are different terms being used, but if we look a little bit, go back and see when did it all started? Well, Nasir, I was just preparing and I saw first incidents of sustainable or responsible investing back in 16th century, right? Church of England was excluding certain sin stocks, which exactly is what we can, what we um, consider today exclusionary criteria, right? So this is, well, first thing to understand is this is not something new. We have been doing this for a long time. Uh, but depending on different, let's say, countries, beliefs, um, uh, practices, we call it differently. So if I were to uh, group all what we do today, be it sustainable investing, ethical investing, microfinance, impact finance, all that, I would do it in two main groups. 
One group is more of a thematic investing, meaning referring to the sustainable development goals, 17 challenges which we have, which we want to, uh, for which we want to uh, mobilize capital, such as, for example, alleviation of poverty, or there should be no hunger, or there should be, I don't know, uh, there should be climate action, there should be sustainable cities built around. So all those sustainable development goals, and for that, whatever new capital we are going to bring in, I would like to call put that all together in, in an area which we can define as thematic or impact investing, meaning going for a theme which is of which is a societal or environmental challenge and investing in that team so that we can achieve those sustainable development goals. That's on one side. However, on the other side, which is more popular, more known, which is, is ESG investing, is not necessarily investing, it's not, it's not obligatory to invest in one of those themes. ESG investing does not necessarily mean you have to invest in climate finance, you have to invest in social investing. You could be investing in any type of sector, any type of activity, as long as it is not controversial, as long as it is not considered exclusionary. However, while doing that, you consider the ESG factors, environmental social governance factors, in, into your investment process, and that has a reflection, that has, a, that has an influence on your investment decision. So one is, for, for me, in simple words, ESG is more of a capital cleansing exercise, the money which is out there already in the market, you're trying to clean them with certain criteria, certain best market practices in terms of environment social. However, impact investing is going through a theme, going and investing, identififying a team and, and, and investing in order to um, if, uh, in order to come over of those challenges which we have, be it societal challenges or be it environmental challenges. That's how I would group them in two of these main areas. Okay, thank you, Sachin. I, I think I'm getting that distinction here. Um, Ian, I mean, you essentially work in this sector, providing a product within this sector. I mean, how do you view it as, as, as a technology, as a fund solutions provider? Um, with your solution? I mean, did you actively pursue to work in this area? How would you classify yourself and your product and service? Well, thank you, Nasir, for, uh, uh, for that question. What we do at Ecofolio, we focus really just on, on one sector, <clears throat> which is uh, nature-based and land-based assets. And we think, you know, like forests and oceans and rivers. And uh, what we're thinking is that there's a tremendous market failure in, in this particular sector. Our long-term mission is to be able to make the sector a little bit more investable by, making, uh, by creating financial inclusion. And we think that blockchain is a, is a great way of doing that. The second thing is that uh, liquidity creation, where um, a lot of these nature-based assets like forests, we think are virtuous and desirable for all sorts of reasons, especially the fact that they are real assets uh, in the current economic climate. So, the other two things that I'll just to add before I, um, beside nature-based assets, to me, sustainable finance is two more things that we probably have to look at, which is uh, how do we finance the transition to a circular economy uh, and our use of resources. And the last aspect is how we use um, energy. Can we move into a fully renewable, uh, zero carbon footprint use, uh, harnessing and spending of energy? Thank you, Ian. Um, and Natalie, you seem to be itching to respond to that. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, because I wanted to just add um, two additional lenses to the definition that we've just discussed. Um, the one is the policymaker lens. So for the first time, really, um, with the report that the European Commission has just published at the beginning of March, the, the EU taxonomy, um, we also have the policymaker definition. So they have identified in the taxonomy which economic activities they consider to be green. Very good that they also introduce the concept of enabling activities and transitioning activities. Um, but they also added that uh, for any um, product to be labeled sustainable, they also need to meet minimum safeguards with regards to human rights or international labor rights. So it's a bit more comprehensive ESG package, but the focus is on E, but it introduces the S and the G as well. The second lens um, that I wanted to mention as a definition of sustainable finance 
is our clients themselves. So uh, we may have lots of philosophies and policy definitions around um, how, what is ESG or what is sustainable finance, but ultimately it is our uh, clients, the capital owners, um, that uh, would, pre would express preferences for a specific um, aspect of what they themselves consider to be sustainable or not, um, that can vary. Um, for example, nuclear power for some clients is uh, considered sustainable, whereas for others not. Um, hence, we as the stewards of the way we allocate and manage the capital on behalf of our clients, obviously have to put in practice um, through our products um, also their specific preferences. Okay. Um, I mean, we talk, you, you started already talking about uh, policy then, and I, I do want to ask a few things around that in a second, but I, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I'm more confused than I was at the start or if I'm better off right now. Maybe some of the Q&A can answer this, but I think the, um, the, the point you made there, Natalie, at the end was is really the critical element here is what do the client want, right? I mean, classifications are classifications, but I think it's down to the client as to how they define uh, their investment principles and their, and their desire to invest in particular themes. So I think everyone looks at it slightly differently. But as I said, you, you touched on the policy uh, framework here. I mean, what does the reg I mean, regulation as a whole is, is a, an entire four hour webinar by itself, if not longer. Um, but let's try and talk about some elements of regulation and policy at the EU level around, uh, I'm very hesitant as to what to call it now, ESG, um, sustainable investing. Let's call it ESG. Let's stick with that one. Um, what's going on around policy harmonization around the EU? Things are being done to make things easier for investors, for the industry as a whole around this, um, to, to help drive demand and um, investments. Why don't we go to... Sachin? Yes. Uh, on the policy side, as, as, um, as Natalie mentioned earlier, the, the earlier action which we saw, particularly here in the European Union member states, is um, uh, in, 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 in end of 2015, um, uh, as EU, but number of individual uh, member states also, we all signed the Paris Agreement, where we agreed on achieving certain, uh, let's say, climate-related goals or, or temperature-related goals without going into further details. And that, of course, started the, 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 the discussion around, around what else could be done. And um, uh, just right, right after that COP21, um, uh, the European Commission came up with an idea about uh, forming a high-level expert group on sustainable finance about 20 experts from different member states coming up with certain recommendations on what should we be doing in order to uh, mobilize further capital in sustainable finance as such. And just as a result of the working group or work which the high level expert group done, um, in March 2018, the EU came up with something called Action Plan on Sustainable Finance or Financing Sustainable Growth. The main aim of that action plan was reorienting capital flows towards sustainable investments, of course, uh, mainstreaming, mainstreaming sustainability risks into sustainable uh, into risk management so that asset managers, fund managers or funds themselves consider ESG or sustainability not just as something good to do, but something which is an important factor, something which is inbuilt within the systems such as risk management. And the third uh, aim or ambition was fostering transparency and long-termism in market as such. That was the main aim, that was the main idea when the action plan was launched. And towards that, there were three legislative proposals coming in. We started our discussion today about defining or, or, or a little bit explaining what sustainable finance is. And this is not only we wonder about that whole market wonders about that. This was very, um, very uh, timely identified the commission. And one of the first legislative proposal came in is about taxonomy, meaning a little bit, let's say, call it dictionary, call it a classification system, call it a, a, a standard definitions as such. At least for member states, uh, we should have a dictionary, we should have a rule book where we identify and describe in details 
what do we mean by sustainable finance? What do we mean by green finance? What are the different shades of those greens, right? And that's all which is covered in the taxonomy exercise. The second exercise or second legislative proposal which um, the EU came up with is around disclosures, meaning disclosing and provide, so disclosing the sustainability credentials of that particular investment products so that investors have the choice to and a choice to choose or not to choose based on the sustainability risks involved in that product. And the third legislative proposal, the proposal was around low carbon benchmarks. So these were the proposals. Of course, in the meantime, a lot has happened. Um, there was a technical expert group um, further defining all the legislative proposals, the actions to be taken. And just last month, there was announced, uh, the commission announced the revised or renewed sustainable finance strategy, of course, with reference to the Green Deal, which we have been, which the new commission has been announcing earlier this year or late last year sorry um, and, and the new sustainable finance strategy discusses more about strengthening the foundation of sustainable finance it's it, it also speaks about increasing opportunities for sustainable finance but also it goes very clear on um, the the environmental and climate risks so at the end of the day what the commission is trying to do is um, it, it, in order to mobilize uh, further capital we need clarity uh, we need more information, we need more transparency. And that is all covered in these different legislations. One of the earliest one, which is coming, which is related to sustainability related disclosures um, for, for asset managers, uh, which is to be active in March, 2021, just less than a year time left. Um, that's the first, I would say, which is the earliest one to come. But whole lot of, I mean, uh, the, the whole legislative exercise is a lengthy one, it's complex one, and it's not going to be just coming in one go, but let's say next, I wouldn't be surprised, next three to five years, we'll keep repeating, we'll keep speaking about the legislative regulatory measures on the sustainable finance industry in Europe particularly. Okay, thank you for that, Sachin. Um, I'm going to be devil's advocate in a minute with Natalie, but before I do that, I'm gonna ask Ian. Ian, again, on the, I'm interested in your perspective because you're bridging the technology element, which is also using that technology to provide fund products, essentially, or investment products in this area, uh, be it within a very specific niche. Uh, how engaged have you been around the regulatory and um, sort of um, policy perspective? And do you see it as an enabler or a hindrance? That's a very interesting question, um, Nasir. The short answer to your question is yes. Um, despite uh, entrepreneurs like myself um, taking in the, the technology gospel, <laughs> should I say, uh, a little bit ironically, uh, what quickly we find out, fintech entrepreneurs like myself, is that we have to play by the rules. And there's um, a lot of these rules were not built for the possibilities of the technology that we're exploring. I mean, I remember talking to a friend of mine and says, oh, yeah, you know, we're trying to build this uh, blockchain-based instruments and a stable coin. And he was like, you know, he just kind of looked at me and says, yeah, you know, what you're doing is securitization. We understand what you're doing. <laughs> so to answer the second bit of your question, do I see it as an opportunity or a, a hindrance? I think, uh, I think it's both. <laughs> Part of the, the, the legacy system was really built for a really biofficated world. Uh, and uh, as I was telling a friend, a blockchain really doesn't discriminate of whether you're a sophisticated, so sophisticated investor or not. But you know, financial rules, for good reason, differentiate whether you're a sophisticated investor or not. <laughs> On the flip side of it, the part of it which I see as an opportunity, which is really quite uh, special, I would say, at the EU level, was uh, I think the European Commission has passed the law sometime in summer last year uh, on prospectus requirements that essentially deregulates the bottom of the market and is a bit of a godsend for blockchain entrepreneurs like me because it leaves us the space for controlled and intelligent uh, experimentation and it also leaves us the, the road to be able to work up into more um, comprehensive <laughs> legislation as, as we grow our business. So I think it's both. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, Natalie, as I said, I'm gonna be devil's advocate with you here. Um, I, 
I mean, Sachin gave an overview of some of the actions that are occurring on policy and regulatory level. I'm sure you can add even more to that as well. So here's my question. Um, the whole sector is still relatively early in its um, growth and its uh, life cycle. Are not increasing policy, legislative, regulatory actions, such as say on what, as you mentioned before, reporting requirements, etc., creating barriers to the growth of this sector? Um, in that, for example, increased uh, requirements around reporting during the life cycle of an ESG security actually adds increasing cost to the issuer of that security, which would maybe put off certain people wanting to issue a, for example, green bond or another type of security. Your thoughts? I told you I'd be annoying, but I am. <laughs> no, it's great. I love that you ask the, the challenging questions. Um, so I think um, that it's, it's true some um, of the financial industry players might perceive it as a barrier because they might be so far behind the curve um, that for them uh, obviously it becomes a, a kind of a, a very difficult exercise. Um, but uh, I think for fidelity it's really um, more of a, a way to streamline both the demand and the supply side. So if you look at what the policies are trying to do and, and building on Sachin's point as well, but just simplifying it um, to two just simple buckets, um, the policies are um, some addressed to the corporates to ask them to simply disclose more data, ESG relevant data. And the second bucket is the um, whole uh, financial system. So the banks, insurance, the asset managers, to take these factors that the corporates disclose into account when they invest or when they lend or when they insure. Um, and, and our sort of task now really is as asset managers to engage again with our clients, so the asset owners, to identify um, what is their preference, um, to design products um, that are suitable for um, their risk profile and for what they uh, try to achieve. And um, hence, I would actually not view um, the new policies as a barrier at all. I would see it as an enabling regulation that allows the corporates that have to disclose uh, to give them a, a framework on what and how to disclose to make it a, a level playing field uh, equal to all. And also to um, streamline the financial industry as a whole, so that we know what are the requirements, what should we be taking into account, and most importantly, how do we actively communicate um, with our clients around these things. So, um, and you mentioned the costs also for the issuers. I guess, um, yes, there might be some level of costs um, at the initial, sort of when they first set up how to measure their ESG, especially the, the climate related emissions that they have, they will be new technologies uh, that will come to the market that will help the individual sectors to measure what is relevant for them, be it automotive or healthcare or consumer goods, etc. So technology will hopefully um, drive down the costs for the issuers when they measure their own ESG footprint and behavior. Um, and ultimately it becomes such a fundamental thing in our new economic order uh, that uh, it, it's a it's a necessary um, a necessary sort of philosophy we need to embrace across all societal sectors, be it financial, corporates, the consumer, and so on. Okay, I'm going to carry on being devil's advocate here, Natalie, and because I'm going to maybe talk about some practical examples. So for one thing, um, as I have followed Fidelity, I know that you are rather exceptional um, as a company in terms of embracing new technologies. And you did mention technology there. And technology, I think, is probably very key to ensuring costs are managed in this scenario, um, generally speaking. But the, the vast majority of the fund sector is nowhere near where you are, quite honestly, as far as we can see anyway. Um, but let me give you, let's talk about a little example. Say I'm a large scale real estate owner, my, that's my activity, and I want to issue a bond to finance 
the um, refitting of all of my commercial property with low energy lighting and electricity, right? And I could do that and I could label that potentially a green bond and I would have to provide all the reporting on a regular basis for, to, to show that I am meeting the criteria of a green bond, which will cost me extra because I will therefore have to implement a whole variety of widgets and gadgets to show that my uh, lighting and low energy consumption is exactly what I said it was. Or I could just issue a bond that will finance all that um, um, investment that I require and isn't that just as attractive anyway and it will cost me a hell of a lot less why would i issue a green when it costs me more to do so? okay i give you one very good reason why i think it, it would make sense oh um, let me add one thing to that now okay right? thematic investment right mm -hmm. now that would, if i classify it as a green investment or an esg investment that's an allocation of a certain percentage of a portfolio from an investor which today mm -hmm. Still quite small and still not as widespread as we would like. Whereas if if I issued it as a bond, I'm potentially the rest of the portfolio, say 90% of their investment philosophy, as opposed to putting it into a thematic mm. investment. Yeah, right. I'm potentially actually. No, it's it's a very interesting question, and um, maybe to explain, also assuming that perhaps not not all of the audience um, will know exactly um, some of the terms that you've mentioned. But um, so what what fidelity? What we've done last year is we've developed our own ESG um, proprietary rating tool, and which means we have um, pretty much assessed all of our three and a half thousand corporates that we invest in with regards to E, S, and G criteria. And now there's a reason, coming to your question, why should an issuer issue green bonds instead of non-green bonds is um, that we've identified over the last couple of months for the first time we were able, because we've developed this tool last year, um, we were for the first time able to measure how do these corporates perform now in the light of the very challenging market conditions since the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, and it turns out that we've gathered uh, data uh, that especially those uh, corporates that we've ranked very highly with regards to ESG um, have suffered less losses uh, than the non-ESG assets and um, non-ESG tag yes, type. So for that report, uh, it was very interesting. So, so, and, and that um, was um, evidence that was lacking before in the market, um, and there, there is increasing data evidence now coming through various different independent sources and we can confirm that through our own internal proprietary rating tool um, that shows that the ESG assets sim seem to outperform. Hence, um, if, uh, if an issuer can demonstrate that, uh, that a bond or that as a corporate they uh, meet a very high ESG quality criteria, um, then that can also mean that they might be stronger with regards to the financial performance and making them a more attractive investment target. So this is a very interesting point. I, I, maybe I gave you a bit of a leader there. Um, I find this whole principle of thematic investment and classification to be a misnomer and actually restrictive to the growth of this sector. I'm going to be devil's advocate here again. Because we talk about green investing, sustainable investing, but the fact of the matter is portfolios are still designed around Pareto optimality and, and mathematics and numbers. And what you've just done is quantify some of this, right? Exactly. Uh, why are we not creating more data in general um, to provide the quantifiable measures that investors would feed into their models and then just get rid of all this thematic nonsense? <laughs> yes, you, I think you're mentioning already the end um, stage. And just yeah. everything is ranked. Exactly. All right, uh, Ian, um, Ian's, Ian's a very good example. I do want to ask Ian this because, correct me if I'm wrong, Ian, but um, your forestry investments are raking in about 70% annualized, right? 7%, not 70%, sorry, 7%. Is that right? <laughs> Well, I would say that uh, it depends on the time time schedule. I am, I mean, they are, they are cyclical, but yes, uh, we do believe that the, the the forest assets that we're looking at in emerging and frontier markets have an expected IRR of somewhere between eight and ten percent. 
over the long term. So we can do good and get paid. That's exciting for investors, I think. So yes, yes. Just to, as long just as you're patient. That, <laughs> just to add on that, Nassim, Morningstar mm -hmm. come up with a, with a study just end of March, uh, which also confirms again that the ESG funds, um, those funds which consider ESG or impact in their investment policies uh, are performing better um, than the mainstream one as of end of March. And I know that you've been seeing increased demand for your labels as well, and it's been growing increasingly, right? Absolutely. I mean, labels, well, particularly if we speak about our ESG label, um, uh, we, we, we witnessed a growth of about 166% in the last 12 months. We label about 123 funds as of today. Only I'm speaking about ESG, but overall about 196 products with about 106 billion assets under management. So growth is there, and I clearly see some, some key drivers behind that. Well, first, um, uh, more and more awareness among investor community. Well, institutional investors always knew about what this ESG and sustainable investing is, but uh, uh, per, per retail investors, particularly millennials, are, are very much interested and very much entering into the market. Second, uh, regulatory policy awareness around that. So all, if you hear every day that EU is coming up with legislative proposals and something you need to do about it, um, well, you will do it. And uh, particularly if you are a, a reasonable size asset manager, you simply cannot afford to say, what is this ESG? That time has gone, right? So we certainly asset managers, uh, be it small, be it big, all of them are looking at it. Um, third point, third main driver, again, for growth of labels, but for growth of sustainable finance as such is also growth potential. Uh, look at the SDGs. We have identified these 17 goals and the amount of money which we require in order to meet the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, I, I won't go in numbers, but it's in trillions. It's in really trillions, right? So, so, so the potential to 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 invest in health, in education, in uh, I, I don't know, sustainable real estate, in um, in 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 water, in 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 blue economy. All this is so huge that simply uh, let's forget about the philosophical, emotional part of why one should be sustainably considering their portfolios or why sustainability is important. Let's forget that emotional part. But just from business perspective, this is a super, super profitable, super growing business. And even if you consider that, I think that also will contribute to the sustainable uh, growth of sustainable assets. And I think that's what's happening and resulting in numbers growing up. No, I, th I think that's absolutely key. I mean, to draw a little parallel that many of you will talk about, uh, know about is the Sukuk market. Now, be it it's not quite the same, but kind of sometimes can fit into the whole ESG in some cases. But it seemed to have plateaued out at some point because the focus always seemed to be on the Islamic element rather than on the return element. And I think increasingly, as you guys are talking about, Natalie, with your study, et cetera, and Morningstar, um, putting more focus on the returns and how profitable while doing good is, is an important characteristic, I think will drive this market. Um, Sachin, I, I wanna continue with you, if, um, following up on something Natalie talked about, and we can't ignore this, um, COVID-19. How has COVID-19 impacted this sector? What, what is, have you seen some changes, uh, catalysts, et cetera, what's, what's happening? What is COVID-19 resulting in? Resulting in asking questions about from employee side, from company side, are companies ready for disaster management? Do we have certain contingency plans? How do we treat our employees? If our employees are, let's say, vulnerable to the health situation now, are we allowed or are we, are we as employees considering them to keep at home for some time? Uh, are we, are we, how, how are we managing uh, companies while people are absent in the offices itself? Um, uh, how, 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 is, uh, how is supply chain around that? How are we treating our suppliers when they are not able to provide supplies in this all time? So businesses, all the effects of COVID-19 are basically those ESG criteria which we have in, let's say, uh, so which an ESG fund is supposed to monitor over time. So there is nothing new in COVID-19, which, which is coming up, which ESG managers didn't consider or should not have been considering in their day-to-day -day management of ESG funds, right? But that's in, and this all resulting in attention 
once again attention uh, or higher attention to, to factors such as, as I said, a contingency plan, disaster management and all that. Uh, and that all will be resulting in, um, in, in, in I would say, in, in some sense, attention, but numbers also, growth also for ESG assets as such. Now, if we speak about something specific, let's say, what will it happen for climate? What will it mean for climate? Well, uh, with all businesses stopped for some time, uh, we are supposed to reduce about 5% of our global emissions this year. That's about 2,000 um, uh, 2, metric tons carbon, which means if we continue like this for 10 years, we probably would be able to achieve the goals which we have been dreaming to achieve, right? Of course, this is not going to happen because all what is the results, the, the, the positive results which we have is because businesses or, or industries are uh, on standby, but that's not going to continue. Of course, there is other side also is, uh, we again, we are in financial market, we are in market economy, so businesses need to run and that will result in higher emissions also. But uh, it, uh, what I'm trying to say is there are certainly some very, very positive factors of COVID crisis on particularly, let's say, bringing attention or bringing even concrete results toward clim towards climate action. Social, it's very clear. I mean, we, 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 we it's again, uh, often what, what, is, what happens is when we speak about sustainability or sustainable finance, our attention is generally very much towards environmental factors. Whereas crisis like COVID, which is a health and economic crisis, again puts right at the center how S of the social ESG is also important, how social factors of ESG are equally, if not less, important um, as that to environment. So overall, I would say the COVID crisis in general should result in, in some particular particular positive impact or positive, let's say, uh, at least signals towards uh, sustainability or sustainable finance. Thank you, Sachin. Um, just very quickly, we're going to speak for another five, maybe 10 minutes maximum, um, and then allow the audience to ask some questions. So audience, please um, do ask, start putting in your Q&As in the Q&A section so that we can address some of those questions. Natalie, um, I mean, obviously this sector does not function just with investors and the investment management companies. The entire infrastructure of the fund industry have to adapt, to change, to do things slightly differently in order to support these products, for example, on the reporting requirements, etc. How are you um, seeing your service providers or broadly the industry of service providers, administrators, lawyers, be it custodians, whoever it may be, adapting to enable um, the growth of this sector. Um, and I'm going to, again, be slightly devil's advocate here to you, Natalie. Um, I note that in the end of last year, in a parallel sector of development, uh, which is the crypto industry, Fidelity decided to become a self-custodian. I don't know if that was because your service doing enough and you got fed up and I'm wondering if uh, you're seeing the service providers doing enough in this sector. I'm nasty. I'm <laughs> this is a very good question. Thank you Nasir. So um, what we observe definitely is that everybody's upskilling across the entire ecosystem of services everybody is and uh, you can see it with the law firms and their advisory functions are studying all the policies that are coming out to advise their clients on how to apply them and how to comply them with them um, the audit firms are um, as well upskilling and um, giving consulting advice to the corporates um, and especially because um, the corporates uh, to some extent would see value in having audited ESG type reports because it gives an external validation to their self-assessment. Um, so I see definitely a, a trend across the board uh, of upskilling and it's a journey again for, for everybody. Yes, the regulations are new that are explaining and more streamlining uh, what, how, do we, how do they see and what would they expect um, in the ESG space to be put into place. Um, but I also wanted to use the opportunity to quickly answer to the previous question on COVID-19, um, where we as asset managers see three um, things as well um, that uh, are highlighted through the situation. 
Um, so the first is that it's definitely accelerated the sustainable finance um, theme overall. Um, at the beginning, I think many were quite worried that suddenly uh, all the focus was simply just on the health crisis. Um, but after a couple of weeks and even months, it became more clear um, how closely these factors, ESG, are interdependent at the global level. And uh, the policymakers have acknowledged in order to uh, prevent a future or more severe pandemic outbreaks, um, the climate agenda has to be put up on the very top again through the European Green Deal, which is a core piece and it will be combined with a fiscal policy, the EU budget over the next seven year cycle, so 2021 to 27, the multi-annual financial framework of the EU. Um, there will be two core pieces, which are the digital agenda, going back to technology, and the other one is the European Green Deal. So it's, it, the whole COVID-19 crisis has even um, accelerated the ESG and it shows that the SNG factors are much more important than I think some may have been aware before because how corporates behave and, and how certain countries behave if there is a lockdown can have a massive impact on their uh, financials, of course. And um, one other observation I think is really important is as we see all of these emergency funding that the governments are now pushing, putting into the economy, um, and, and also in support of corporates, of employees and of, of countries. Um, when, when they invest now in, to, in the recovery, um, they too uh, put it at some type of conditionality. And I think that that is the right thing, that they shouldn't just ask high standards from the private sector when we invest, but that they also in the public space, in the public sector in investing, apply um, the same high standards so that we have a level playing field and I think that that is very welcome. If, um, if I may not say one, one point which uh, Natalie mentioned which is more on the reporting side because the, the EU initiatives or let's say more awareness will require also um, a more reporting but here I think we have to be a bit careful because uh, there have been examples um, tried out in a number of countries around asking corporates, asking financial institutions to report on their non-financial or extra financial performance or ESG factors in general. However, um, until we exactly decide what we are asking and in what form we are asking, the experiment is almost uh, close to failed because I give an example of um, Article 173, which um, France um, initiated for, for quite some time now, multiple number of years. And under that, a certain, uh, uh, about a certain limit of assets under management or overall business, uh, uh, companies were supposed to report on their non-financial performance. Um, without any detail, let's say, indication on what exactly, to what length, how do you measure, or what do we exactly need to report and all that. What it ended up, well, some companies had a report of two pages, some companies had a report of 150 pages, right? So that's what we, again, if, we, if our aim is, uh, the aim should be always that sustainability, ESG, should come within from the spirit of the organizational, the leadership, the strategy that we believe in sustainability or we believe in, um, in ESG because on the longer term, this is going to be positive for the company. If, that, if it comes from that spirit, I think this is going to be certainly beneficial. However, if sustainability ESG is going to be considered from compliance perspective, that because uh, EU is coming up with something, because local regulatory is coming up with something, and we need to rush out, we need to prepare. I asked my consultant, I asked my you know or lawyers to help me, and I put together a report. Uh, that's not something which we are going to. With that, I'm sure if we look at ESG, if we look at sustainability from compliance perspective. The other one of the common, uh, let's say, way of looking at it is communication perspective, which is more of a PR, which is more for, comes from ego, uh, this ego of telling outside how good we are, how, how, how beneficial we are for the society. Again, this may be natural, but... I want to move on to Q&A for the, uh, for the, with the audience, so uh, yeah. let's wrap up. So I, I'm just, I, I will just conclude on that, that if ESG comes from a spirit side, but not from compliance and communication side, I think this would uh, be on longer term beneficial.
Okay, thank you, Sachin. Listen, just very quickly from each of you, uh, very short, what one thing do you think is right now the most important thing we could all do, or you believe is the most important thing that can be done to enhance and to build this sector and to, and to enhance the focus on ESG investing? Natalie. Okay. I think the single most important aspect is investor education. So this is something I personally, but also Fidelity generally is, is very much engaged in because we believe that both retail and institutional sectors, the more they um, are aware that their ESG preferences can drive this trend, um, the more we are certain to quickly go into the right direction. Okay, fantastic. Ian, what do you think? What's your thoughts? That's easy for me. I think we need to a fundamental rethink of how we invest in nature, particularly how we finance photosynthesis because it's crucial to our civilization. Fantastic, Sachin. Last word there. I think if we add transparency around what do we mean by sustainability and how do we measure that, I think that's going to help on longer term to attract more attention from investors. Okay. Guys, thank you very much for all your comments and thoughts. And I really want to hand over to hear from the audience now and some Q&A as to um, what they want to ask the panel. So, Sarah, I think you're going to administer this, right? Uh, I think, can you hear me? I think the video has not come back on, but I can you hear me for the questions? You. Okay. Okay, hi. hi. Uh, yes, there are a couple of questions. I think the first one is to do with uh, regulation. So you were, to you were talking earlier about EU regulation in particular. Do the panelists have any comments with regards to uh, how regulation is looking, for example, in the US? And is it going to be a challenge to have international regulation which is aligned yes it's uh, natalie here so um, i think that's an excellent question because ultimately we will only achieve our climate and our social governance targets if the whole world buys into it so it has to be an internationally coordinated effort if we want to have a true impact uh, hence, I think it's very good that the EU has set up an international platform on sustainable finance through which they try to facilitate that dialogue with China and India who have joined that platform, but also Canada and many other countries, hopefully more to join. Um, yes, the US uh, at the federal level, uh, we know, has stepped back from the Paris Accord, but um, we see very positive developments at the state level, to name, for example, California. And I think um, that we need to continue to engage at that level um, because the US is, is one of the most, maybe the most important market here to get on board. But I'm hopeful um, that we will over the many years, um, but even before that, um, manage to get the whole international community mobilized. Great, thank you. And another question that we've come in that's come in is uh, directing investments other than by demonstrating outstanding returns, especially for retail clients, is often achieved via fiscal incentives. Do you believe this is the case for ESG? To the extent it was partly true in the past, do you believe it remains the case post COVID? How do you suggest Europe can address this when fiscal policies remain very national? I think um, fiscal policies have been very national. I think there should be tax incentive for um, ESG uh, investment and general financial products um, to encourage um, sort of a greater expansion of that market. Um, what I think is really positive here again is that the EU is trying to look at an EU fiscal package. Um, so not a, just the EU 27 member states individually approaches, but it's an EU coordinated effort of the seven year um, MFF, so the, the EU budget for the next seven years, where they combine it with the European Green Deal, which um, it foresees investments across all sectors, so including healthcare, automotive, um, renovation wave, for example, for real estate, um, for um, technology. So uh, it's not just in the energy and transport sectors that this Green Deal is looking to invest in, in this fiscal stimulus package, um, but it will touch every single aspect of our economic activity, including the uh, fork to food uh, 
farm to fork strategy. Sorry, it's pretty much how do we um, produce the uh, the products, the nutrition, um, and and our food. Uh, that, that whole supply chain is part of a uh, recipient of fiscal stimulus, and um, I think that's very positive. And they're linking it to the recovery fund. So the EU has developed a, a recovery instrument or is working on that. We will hear on the 19th of June um, what exactly has been agreed amongst the EU member states on the fiscal policy side. And uh, I would say watch the space, um, but I'm positive that they'll come to a solution on the 19th or by July, hopefully. I think I, I would just like to quickly add on that, that the fiscal incentives are more beneficial are, or as Natalie said, the EU's fiscal initiatives at present are more concentrated towards retail investors. Whereas on the institutional investor side, probably it will come, but probably it's not yet clear. Uh, is that correct, Natalie? Because it's more focused, of course, because- if, uh, yeah. I think um, to name also one initiative, there's an EU eco-label board that is trying to develop a retail product for um, financial instruments and hence um, when these um, products uh, receive such label that they would be a tax incentive attached to it. Or one could think in the investment fund industry, uh, can the, there be tax incentive for the uh, most greenest funds or is there a scale possible? So. These are ideas, ideas that are being discussed and developed. Um, and I believe and uh, I'm optimistic that there will be tax incentives for the retail space coming, as there are already subsidies, for example, in the real estate renovation sector. If, um, if households are moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy, same for the automotive sector, where there's a discussion on subsidies for uh, electric vehicles versus uh, fossil fuel motors and that will also apply to financial products. Thank you. Another question is in relation to financing the transition that was referred to earlier and going perhaps beyond the risk considerations for financing projects. Um, how would you see the sustainable finance industry evolving in order to strengthen the di direction of capital towards projects that are going to give us the results we want to see? Perhaps Sachin, you want to consider that one? Yeah, I think it's it's a very interesting question. One of the comments I often um, often come across is when I meet uh, fund managers, uh, thematic meaning the the let's say fund managers which have created projects, which invest in particular theme like climate finance or social. One of the thing which I often hear is there are not enough investable projects. When I meet projects. Um, projects often complain about, well, where are the investors? You guys speak about billions and trillions which are supposed to come in sustainable finance, but where are those investors? We have this brilliant project. And I, I suppose Ian will, Ian will second on that. So uh, that, that's the whole point. Um, I, I mean, yes, um, I, and, and the question relates more to the project financing side, meaning more thematic side. It is indeed, um, a, a, a particularly, and, and as the taxonomy is very much focused on very much environmental assets and not, uh, let's say, the broader ESG side, certainly this should allow um, to, 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 to mobilize further capital, to, to identify such projects and going beyond just what we see on the ESG side, considering the risk and that's enough. But on the, on the particular project side, I suppose that all the action plan and all the EU initiatives certainly should be helping to, um, to, to develop this sector and further. If I, could, uh, if I could jump in with a small illustration, Sachin. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, one of the things that I first looked at was financing a plantation forest in Panama. And quite quickly, I was like, okay, this is 8 to 10% returns, as Nasir uh, mentioned. That checks out if it's institutional quality. But there's other things about this that makes it extremely hard to securitize, as I quickly found out. Just as one project as an illustration, right? First of all, it takes 25 years from plantation to maturity, which is, puts it outside the timeline of most uh, traditional investors. The second thing is that you have venture risk in the first two years because the trees can die, okay? And the last thing is that you have this dribble of cash flow that goes out 
of about one one to two percent because workers need to be paid to keep the trees uh, actually alive and not strangled. Uh, just to illustrate, this small little example illustrates that you have a, a great project that's virtuous, that everybody would like to finance, but somehow in just the nature of the way that the cash flows go and the way that the, the long time tenure puts it outside the mandate of even the most well-meaning of investors. <laughs> Uh, well, just to finish off on this, I see this as a financial engineering and financial innovation problem. And uh, this is something that will probably, uh, that a lot of people on this call and, out, and in Luxembourg particularly are in a very unique position to start thinking about things from gr the ground up. Thank you very much. Uh, I think our time is just about up. So uh, I would like to thank all of the panelists this afternoon for what was a very insightful and interesting discussion. I can see that we could probably go on for another two or three hours on this subject. Um, before we go, I would just also like to point out a couple of webinars that the Chamber has coming up in the coming weeks. So next week we have uh, Luke Frieden and the uh, Michelle Petit from Clifford Chance who will be talking about Brexit another topic that is coming back onto our radar screen as we go into the home straight um, before the 31st of December deadline. And the following week, there is a uh, webinar on uh, leadership in, at times of crisis, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, I do invite you to uh, sign up for those. And in the meantime, thank you very much again, and I wish everyone a, good, a very good evening. Thank you very much.